Hi, and welcome back. I'm Simi Lerner, and this is the Judaism From Within podcast, and we're continuing our journey through Chorev. Um, when it comes to the Eidos, we had the Tyrais, which are the philosophical, the Eidos, which are the symbolic. We're now moving on to the Mishpatim, and the Mishpatim are the ones we kind of all relate to in a more intuitive level, the ideas of justice, the ideas of justice towards other human beings, and we're going to develop that. But this is the last one of the Eidos, and the Eidos were actually quite hard to get through in a sense, because often they're not that relatable in terms of their overall structure, in terms of direct meaning. And we plumb the depths, and Rav Hirsch describes the nuances that bring out the meaning. I had a particularly difficult time when it came to Avelos. As I mentioned, at the, thank God, at the point of recording this podcast, I'd never experienced it. So there was a bit of a, a lack of authenticity, I felt, with trying to truly give over of Hirsch's sensitivity and his... Uh, or the importance he felt that was given over when our sages bring out the idea or the space for a person to mourn, but also constricting it in a way, so not giving it too much, but at the same time giving it its voice. What I want to do today is really just talk about the five areas that we do during our Vedas. There's the first stage, the second stage, and the third stage. The first stage we discussed last week, and the last stage is when a person re-enters into the community. He's, he's He hasn't taken care of his externals, his internal is emerging out of this dark place, and then he's welcomed into the community. And as we mentioned last time, the community it heals by the nature of its immortality. The community doesn't die in the same sense that humans die. The community and death don't mix but that's why when the community comes in and embraces the individual, that's the expression of leaving the time of mourning. And it brings a whole conversation of the importance of soci- like your social life and your friends and the importance of being held in that respect. But the, the stage that's known as Avelus, I believe Rav Hirsch relates it to the word Aval, which is but, which you can, it, that almost that gap between the way you expected things to be and the way things are. And that's recognized and that's validated. So there are five stages, but beforehand, I want to read something that Rav Hirsch writes, and I don't think I've done this before, but I thought in this sense, it really does make sense. Because the five stages are, I mean, I call them stages, it's more areas of restriction, or the prohibition to do melacha during the seven days of mourning. The same idea kind of relates to Shabbos and Yom Tov. It's a time to gain strength, it's a time to reflect, it's a time to focus in on the now. Once again, the Chazal giving the space. And it's interesting, these ideas are actually derived from Yecheskel and Aaron in terms of how they acted. And they acted actually by distancing themselves from mourning. And that sort of gave license to recognize that for the majority of us who aren't involved in the spirit or directly involved in the community in the sense the Kohen Gadol or a Kohen or a prophet was, there is space for us to mourn and an importance for us to mourn. We then have the idea of um, removing the shoes. That's taking away your foundation, a recognition that you're stepping on God's world. And that's sort of educating you to the, I suppose, constraining the morning. That there's not, it's not a empty pit of nothingness that you're mourning with. You're not focusing on nothing. There, there is still a, a God that's part of reality that is aware of what has happened. And there is meaning to it. And then you have the shift in the other direction with the third, which is not greeting, the focus in on the self. So you have this oscillation between the the giving it its space and then at the same time constricting it. And then the last two are mental occupation, the way Rav Hirsch describes it. And lastly, the idea of your external appearance takes a hit. Um, And the mental occupation sort of reflects back to the first one. We don't study Tyra, we don't study things that give us joy, perhaps, because it's a once again, all these are on focusing in on the the situation and the, the gravity of the situation, I suppose. And there's plenty more to discuss, and I really do encourage you to, if you're ever in such a state, to go to Rav Hirsch's understanding of Avelos and immerse yourself in his explanations and the details. But what I wanted to do now is really just read Rav Hirsch's articulation of why Chazal why the Chachamim gave us this latitude, why they felt the need to indulge, but at the same time to curtail. Our sages gave latitude to our feeling of mourning so that these feelings too might become the source of spiritual strength for life. 
but at the same time they wanted to confine such mourning within these limits. Three days of tears, seven days of lamentation, and thirty days, or three months, of neglect of the outside appearance until he's, this is me, until he's in back into the community. This point I think is very key. If more, then God says, have you then more merciful love for the one that has passed away than I? Is he not my child? Am I not his father? That reflection or that meditation on the relationship with the dead, I, I think is very key because it threatens to overwhelm. And he goes on to explain that the idea of grabbingness that we have to things, things we love, even for the most noble reasons, once we grab them, we invest them with our own ego. And then when they pass, we feel that we too have died along with them. And the um, areas of cutting yourself or removing hair when a person passes away, where Persh gives feels gives voice to this sort of misconception or this uh, toxic approach that when someone dies, you have to take some of you with them. And to, to like, I suppose a little recap, we, we, we spoke about Rav Hirsch's articulation of this from his words, the idea that there needs to be a framework to mourning, but a need for mourning at the same time. And the five stages of mourning that we go through, or the five things we take upon ourselves to allow us to reflect in this direction. And just to end up, and I think with this we'll end the um, Eidos of Rav Hirsch. And as I said, there is plenty more to discuss, but it, specifically in this area, I'm going to end with the last phrase that he ends his Eidos with. Because when things do go, and if he takes away, recognizing the taking, as in the giving, the same loving fatherly hand, and with what is left to you in whatever condition you may be, rise to live, fulfill the will of God, pursue it, and blessing him until he also calls you away to another existence and to a new life. I think that's the way to end such a conversation about bereavement. The main point, I suppose we could say, is that it's a recognition that we're human. That has to be given its space. But not only because, like, oh, never we need it. But no, there is something to experience, to grow. And through the experience of recognizing that Hashem takes away, and Hashem gives, we can grow through that experience and at the same time gain solace that one day we too will be called to that new life. It's one of those things that we can sometimes tend to lean into the more philosophical sides and thereby leave that personal aspect of Hashem out of the picture. And Rav Hirsch in in Boratius discusses this in contrast to Rambam, in the need to not lean into the philosophy too much because then you lose the personality of God. And without the personality of God, yes, that's, that's a cost in your monotheism, but everyone makes a cost in their absolute Aristotelian, if you will, monotheism. And this, I think, cannot be overstressed, especially in the area of bereavement. Because on the one side, the nature of personality makes it difficult because it was taken. But at the same time, the nature of the personality we're talking about is Hashem. And that's key in focusing in on. Because the love that God gives, when it's taken away, it's also in love. How we understand that? The point is that we still identify God as a God of love. And then one day we are also called to that final journey. Thank you so much for listening. Um, and we will begin next week with the Mishpatim.